What's going on, Pop Samurai friends? This is Jelani Hoon. And Paul Pack. We're with Pop Samurai Podcast. We're covering Ohanacon 2017, and we're with... Eric Stewart. Thank you so much, Eric Stewart, for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, this is making one of another one of my childhood dreams come true. Um, just having you being a part of Pokemon, Brock, and then... And, and, also on the other on the other end with Yu-Gi-Oh being Kaiba, I was oh I, I was like yes if I could get an interview, my, my dreams will be set. All right, so I'm all good. Wow. <laughs> um, I just want to say one thing. Yesterday Friday you had a concert that the, the you put on. It was wonderful. Uh, I, I want to get that out of the way first. That I love your music. Hopefully I'm gonna pick up a CD before I go. Um, uh, you had a long background in music, right? I mean. What, what, what is it like uh, jumping between voice work and music and kind of keeping those two, balancing those two passions of like, I, I love being on this and music? Um, well, basically, I started as a singer-songwriter. That's what I did long before I was a voice actor. And when I got a job in a recording studio, I thought it was going to be mostly music. But it turned out that they produced uh, radio and TV commercials, voiceovers. So I learned about that business. But then it made a lot of sense for me because it's the same instrument, singing voice acting, pitch and inflection are the same thing. So um, balancing them out has been pretty easy for me because I also keep the two things separate in terms of what you see and what you hear. So most of the fans that are my anime fans for a long time didn't know what I really looked like. Um, and then my rock fans didn't know that I was doing the cartoon stuff. But then when you put them together, it's kind of, you know, it's two different audiences that I try to bring together. Um, what is it like uh, having... Now that you've done these uh, voices, uh, Brock and and Kaiba, I mean, what is it like being part of like uh, these characters? These roles have like really hit like this kind of um, pop culture icon status of like, oh, you you're, you did Brock or you you did you did Kaiba. I mean, how, how does that feel like having that happen I and mean, blow up so big? You know. Well, every show that you work on, every producer, every director is going to tell you the same thing. This is going to be the biggest thing ever, right? So we hear that a lot as actors. So every time we audition for a show or start working on something, we think, okay, we're going to try to make it the best we can. And if it turns into a success, great. If not, I'll have to go find another gig. Um, but there's definitely something very um, humbling about being involved in two of the most popular anime cartoons of all time. Um, you can ask a six-year-old and a 60-year-old what Pokemon is, and they're going to know. And that's pretty cool. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, not as much, but I love, I mean, Yu-Gi-Oh has been around for a long time as well, um, especially with the card playing, you know, environment as well. You've got two of the most popular card games ever. Um, but it's great. All the, the both uh, James and Brock in the original series um, are characters that I feel very connected to. I mean, uh, their, their personalities are personalities that I think I added to that. Um, I feel very connected to them. Kaiba, same thing. Um, and I love the fact that fans either love the characters or don't like the characters. If you didn't like Kaiba, maybe I was doing a good job, you know? Uh, things like that. So um, it's flattering. Um, I didn't think that it would be something that would be that popular, but it's great, especially they're both popular again 20 years later. Um. Now, well, going into it, like uh, with your music, I mean, what what, it's, what inspired you to go into uh, being a, a musician? I mean, uh, where did that uh, passion come from? When uh, I was in school, we had a, uh, I think it was eighth grade, we had a music class that was taught by a very cool guy named Mike Fogarty. And Mike had a class full of teenage boys that basically weren't going to really listen. And so he decided, this is long before School of Rock, he decided, hey, let's just form a rock band. So he went around the room and he asked everybody what they wanted to play. And uh, it came around to me and I was like, I, I have a guitar. It's got like three strings on it that my dad had picked up in some pawn shop. And, and he was like, OK, you can be the guitar player and we'll get you the other three strings. Um, and so we, we wrote a song and we performed it for the whole school. And that is sort of the test to any performer, any live performer, is when you get that chance, either you will crash and burn and never want to get up on stage again, or it will be that energy that says, this is what I love doing. And that's what I got. So from that point on, I knew I wanted to perform. Um, and I was scared to sing. I've only played guitar. I sang a little bit of backgrounds. And our very first gig, I booked us a gig um, in a bar. I told the guy, I will pack this place. And I was 13. <laughs> and he said, OK. And I said, I will. And so he booked me, even though I wasn't old enough to be in the bar. Um, and I filled it with 13 and 14-year-olds. Of course, no one could drink. And they bought hamburgers and french fries, but I did live up to my word. But we were playing our first gig, and my buddy, who was the lead singer, forgot the words to the first song. So I stepped up to the mic and, and took over. 
And from that point on, I was like, oh, wait, I can sing. So from it's eighth grade on. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I love being a performer. I love being an entertainer. Live theater, live music to me is magical. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, there's things that I like to call beautiful mistakes sometimes. And also be, being able to figure out how to uh, cover for those experiences where things might go wrong. Um, that's the thrill, getting off a script and then having to come back to it. Um, you see a lot of new performers nowadays didn't pay the dues of playing every club where a light catches on fire in the back of the venue or the sound man forgets the keys to, to the equipment room and can't give you any you know amplification. Things like that have happened to me. So when you play a big, big show, you're prepared for everything that can go wrong. And you can still put on a good show. Because if, if the audience sees you sweat, then you're done. But if you can sort of make your way through it, then you're truly a pro. Yeah. That's, that's truly inspiring there. Uh, um, from there, uh, for like the con scenes and fans in, in general, I mean, uh, how does it feel like when someone comes up to you and is inspired by not only maybe your music or your, or your voice roles, but just like everything you've done, you know, and just like uh, being a big fan, I mean, is it, uh, how, how great is it just like having fans come up to you and just like loving your work? Well, as I said before, it's very humbling and it's flattering. You know, it's a job like any other job. The fact that I might be in a public, you know, arena where you might know me because of the work I've done that's in TV or radio or music, that's great. Um, people that are policemen and, and firemen and, and doctors and lawyers, every, but that's still, that's a great job. They might not get the notoriety, but it's still work. So it's nice to be recognized for that. Um, but I also think that you take celebrity, uh, you have to be realistic about it. It's a bonus that when you do what you love, you actually make a living at it. And it's also a bonus that when you do what you love, you get notoriety and you get recognized for your skills. Because there are many, many people that are very talented that we never hear about until maybe even after they're dead. Um, and that's a shame. Um, I think the pressure that's put on the arts is about uh, how much money you make doing it. Where to me, success is really about following your passion. It's the journey, it's not the pot of gold. Because there's years that I make a decent amount of money and then there's years I make no money. Um, but I still always love what I do. You know, I enjoy my work. And uh, I, I just had a conversation recently with a young college graduate. We were talking about jobs and careers. And he was getting into some of the arts and things like that. And of course, a lot of people were saying, don't pursue this, don't pursue that. It's too tough, whatever. And I said, could you imagine if every actor that was told, don't pursue acting because it's too competitive, listen to those people, we would have no actors. We would have no artists. We'd have no musicians if everyone who, li who was trying to do this listened to that kind of advice. And there's only, two pe there's only two reasons why someone would say that to someone else. A, they were scared to do it themselves. Or B, they're jealous that this person has the, the guts to try it. So if you really believe in yourself and you, and, you, and you put your heart into something, don't let somebody say no. You know, it might not happen, but what if is the worst thing that you could possibly say to yourself, right? Um, with all the characters that you've uh, voiced uh, with Brock, James, uh, Kaiba, uh, do you, uh, how close have you, did you grow to some of the roles? I mean, is there a specific one that like, really grew close to, loved how the character was going, and maybe do you have a favorite moment of a character that you, that you voiced? Um, well, it's kind of like having to pick your favorite kid, right? Um, and I'm an only child, and my mother still hasn't done that yet. Uh, with Brock, the comedy of being distracted by shiny objects as a 15-year-old boy, meaning girls, was very funny to me. I mean, that's every, you know, in high school, yes. I was kind of like that, so it's funny to play a character like that. Um, James uh, reminds me of, like, uh, the, uh, the Crane brothers, Fra uh, Frazier and Niles, right? I went to private school, and I went to a very funky private school, and we played sports against very obnoxious sort of, you know, prep schools. And those guys sounded like James. So, you know, these are things that I, I you know, I borrowed from, you know, my own experiences. But with Kaiba, um, the challenge with Kaiba is, Kaiba's not really a character voice. He's me being a little tougher, but it's more about his attitude. And there's a fine line between rival and villain. And I, I, I always have to work at not making Kaiba someone that you hate. You might not like him all the time, but there's a human side to it. 
It's like um, we don't hate the Joker. The Joker is an evil person, right? He's a bad guy. But we also know that there's turmoil behind that, and there's a human side to it. Kaiba's not as devious as the Joker, but Kaiba's job is to be a rival that pushes Yugi to be the best he can be. You can't be the champ if there's not a sparring partner, right? So I have to egg him on enough to drive him crazy enough to that he wants to duel me. But I also, when the chips are down, who's the first person that helps him out? When it's really down to that, I won't, you know, I'll sacrifice myself for him. So that dynamic is much more complicated than any of the other characters. That's really great. Um, Paul, you got any questions or anything like that? No, I think he's hit it all. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, for the fans out there, uh, final question for the fans out there. Um, anybody who's really looking to get into, like, music or, or voice work or even anything that artists, you know, uh, creative and anything right. like that, do you have any final maybe words of advice or anything like that, words of anything like that for the fans out there? Yeah, there's a lost art to being an apprentice. You can learn a lot in the classroom, but what you can't learn is the stuff that you learn in real life. If you can find someone to shadow, if you wanted to be a great carpenter, you'd find the best carpenter in town and offer to clean up the shop, hang up the tools, and do whatever it takes as long as you could learn from them. Because bit by bit, you would learn how to handle every situation that was presented. And down the line, you might have your own carpentry business. So if you can find actors to, 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 to work with, um, whether you can shadow them in, the, in their studio, if you can help them out with these kinds of productions, if you're a musician, you know, find a band that you can work with um, just to get that experience. So many of my, uh, my friends that are players started off as roadies, you know, just to, get, just to digest it because you, you need to see what the real life is all about. And it's not about, I need to get paid to do this. You don't want to get taken advantage of, but find the best in the, in the business that you, can, that you can contact and offer up your time to learn from them. There's a respect that comes with that, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's very important. If, you're an, if you want to be an actor, you know, a voice actor, don't limit yourself to saying, I'm a voice actor. You're an actor. Now, that means every opportunity to act, you act, whether you're doing your own show, whether you're doing audiobooks, whether you're, whatever you're doing. Someone wants to do improv with you, act. Um, take, learn how to take direction. Uh, musician, you, you know, practice, play, listen, it, listen to things that you don't necessarily think you're going to like. Expand your, your horizon with that sort of stuff. You might go, I don't like heavy metal. Oh my goodness, I love heavy metal. Wait a second, what am I doing listening to this jazz stuff? You'll, you'll learn from all of that stuff. So do, have an open mind. But apprenticeship is a big thing. It's not necessarily about getting that first gig to be hired. Be in, get your foot in the door. And, and just learn from the best. Thank you so much yeah. for being on the podcast. Uh, for the fans out there, uh, where can they go to find your work or, or maybe follow you on uh, social media? So, uh, ericstewart.com. You can keep track of uh, all of our shows and uh, convention appearances. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. Um, just look for me, a microphone, and my hat. You know, if, if it's a picture of me like that, you found the right Eric Stewart. And it's S T U A R T. You know, as I say, it's like Marty Stewart, not like Rod Stewart. All right. Thank you so much for yeah. being on the podcast. It was, it was truly inspiring. Uh, folks at home, thank you for joining us. Uh, you can find Pop Samurai stuff at popsamurainetwork.com. Follow us on social media, uh, patreon.com slash popsamurai, and uh, at Twitter at popsamuraicast. Uh, this has been Jelani Hoon. And Paul Pack. With the wonderful Eric Stewart. See you guys later. <laughs>